It's the end of the Appalachian League as we know it. And I told you this was coming a long, long time ago. Hey, everybody, Marky Bilson here. And I guess, I mean, 25 years ago, maybe even longer than that, I can remember once uh, Chip Kessler was substituting for Bill Mead on Sportsline. Uh, and I came up with the talk show caller topic. Uh, why don't we have a double-A baseball team in the Tri-Cities? Why do we have the old Appalachian League? Why don't we try to advance up the ladder? And this brought on two days of conversation in the days of caller-driven sports talk radio and such. And I knew that then I could determine a topic better than some of the guys who were hosting shows at the time. And anyway, before I tell you how great I am, you know that... Uh, I want to just say that now, with the Appalachian League losing their affiliation with Major League Baseball and becoming now a summer wooden collegiate bat league for freshmen and sophomores, not even the juniors that are in the Cape Cod League, uh, yeah, maybe this area really does lack vision, the Tri-Cities, Tennessee, slash Virginia area. Uh, I have mentioned this a long time ago, and this is a common theme that I make, but 30 years ago, the Tri-Cities and Las Vegas were essentially the same market size, okay? Essentially, Las Vegas was the 90th largest TV market in the country back in 1990, and the Tri-Cities were 92nd. And I remember seeing that, there are 210 TV markets, I've mentioned this many times before, I remember seeing that when I was a teenager and thinking, boy, there's a lot of potential for growth for the Tri-Cities. I mean, we're bigger than we are giving ourselves credit for being if we're the same size as Las Vegas. But you see where Las Vegas has gone since then. Now they're the 39th largest market in the entire country, whereas the Tri-Cities, Tennessee, Virginia area has regressed to number 99. Yet still we're being told, growing area and all this. Actually, the population, oh, it's about uh, 20, I think it's about 23,000 more than it was then, but it's stagnant. Why is that? Nevada and Tennessee, neither one of them have income taxes. Uh, you know, you'd think, I mean, kerchoo, 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 is that the reason? There are such horrible allergies in Upper East Tennessee? Possibly. But then you'd start thinking, oh, the wonderful scenery of East Tennessee, and it's just desert in Nevada, which is true, too. Now, I personally think that, you know, I've seen one mountain, you've seen them all. I kind of think, you know, yeah, the Vegas Strip, that is, you know, one in a million and all that. Uh, but that's a matter of taste. And there are plenty of people who would prefer mountains, my own grandparents uh, among them, to the neon of Las Vegas. Let's face that fact. Uh, but I would suggest this. Las Vegas is a heck of a lot more exciting than is the Tri-Cities, Tennessee area. One could make the argument that Las Vegas is the most exciting city in America and that the Tri-Cities are maybe the most boring area in America. One could make that argument. Uh, but I think another reason why is sports. And I think it shows you that the fact that there hasn't been that vision or even the lack of political vision around sports and how they can really give a community identity. Las Vegas did not need identity in 1990. You knew where it was. The Tri-Cities did. At the time, they both had nationally ranked college basketball programs that had four initial names, UNLV, ETSU. Uh, but think about this for a second. And both ETSU and UNLV are still trying to reach past glories that they did in those early 90s uh, seasons. But Oscar Goodman, who is the mayor of Las Vegas, he p personally tried to lure more sports to his town. And he made a big campaign, and there were articles in Sports Illustrated. He made appearances on sports talk shows. Come to Las Vegas. At the time, it was thought to be taboo. We can't go there. There's gambling! You know, Casablanca, that sort of thing. But in time, that was worn away. And, hence, the Golden Knights, the Raiders. Well, they always had the prize fights. But uh, NASCAR, all of that coming to Las Vegas. 
what happened in Johnson City? Now, you can say, well, uh, Bristol expanded, and now they can't fill it up. I mean, they're literally looking for better things to do in Bristol, Tennessee, in the Bristol Motor Speed, excuse me, in Bristol Motor Speedway. Uh, but the politicians, nobody ever said, you know what, maybe I ought to try and lure a better baseball team to the area. Maybe we should move up the sports ladder. Instead, they gave millions of dollars to just stay stagnant. $1.5 million from the city of Elizabeth then for a new locker room for the Twins that they used for one season. And I said, this is not a good deal. We should, if you're going to spend that kind of money, build a new ballpark, try to lure in a bigger ball club. Well, look who's right, and look who's out $1.5 million. Even the city of Kingsport was talking about a new downtown ballpark for the Mets. Now, I would suggest build that ballpark if you think it can lure a better team in, a double-A team, now maybe even a single-A team. But this old Appalachian League, this mentality of one town against another in the Tri-Cities, instead of uniting like pro sports are supposed to do, an entire community, that's for the birds. That's way, I mean, it's a 1911 model that you're trying to do in 2020. And... Whereas Oscar Goodman was saying, hey, Raiders, come to Las Vegas. And admittedly, he was not uh, the mayor when the Raiders announced their move. But still, I mean, he had laid the foundation. What do we do in the Tri-Cities? We elected Paul Stanton, the college president who ended the ETSU football program, to Washington County Council. Now, that's like Art Modell being elected mayor of Cleveland. All right, and But it's the difference in sports here, the sports there. It's why I've always said the Tri-Cities, Tennessee area is not a really good sports town because you could see this coming with the Appalachian League. Absolutely you could. And it's embarrassing that this was never, uh, this was never really talked about by city leaders or even really considered that, hey, maybe uh, pro sports, maybe we ought to try to uh, advance up the ladder, so to speak. Now, I will say this. I don't think it's really the end of the world for watching uh, local baseball. In fact, I can see some advantages to it. For instance, you're talking about a college wooden bat league for younger players. And if it can get the publicity, that's a big if. But if it can get the publicity, I could see an increase in um, interest in college baseball programs like ETSU, let alone Tennessee or Wake Forest or whoever else is around, you know, that sort of thing. I could see that Division II teams, uh, that sort of thing, playing in the, uh, you know, new Appalachian League in the summertime, it boosts their brand. Another reason I think this could help is that uh, all the players figure to speak English. They're going to be more quotable. It's going to be uh, something that perhaps sports writers would therefore rather cover. Uh, there will then be a situation where the players do figure to be more local than they were before. Just the caliber of play won't be that good. Not that it was all that good with the Appalachian League. Look, if you went to an Appalachian League game, you knew the majority of those players on that roster were never going to make the major leagues. Meanwhile, if you went to a double-A team's game, say the Tennessee Smokies, you knew that the majority of those players on the roster were going to make the major leagues. By the time you got to double A, you were a serious prospect. You were somebody to be identified. So I think actually there could be more player identification in a college wooden bat league. It sounds crazy, but frankly, if a player is local and also... He is someone that was announced before the season began. Dirty little secret about the Appalachian League was that so many, often the rosters weren't announced until opening day. How could you do a background check? How could you do preseason predictions this way? You couldn't. You now can possibly, assuming they get the media right, if the rosters are announced ahead of time in the new Appalachian League. And that should be a little exciting for the fans in the Tri-Cities. So in that sense, it's good. 
Another thing I don't think that will be hurt are promotions. Boyd Sports was very good with promotions. And they had taken over the operation of three of the minor league baseball teams in the Appalachian League. I did say, hey, watch out for this. I mean, you're talking about one organization that was running four of the five professional sports franchises in Upper East Tennessee. Only the Kingsport Mets were not controlled by Boyd Sports, but the Tennessee Smokies, Greenville Reds, Elizabethan Twins, and Johnson City Cardinals all at the end were run by Boyd Sports. Now, to a certain extent, that was good because the old mom and pop deal, the nonprofit that the Appalachian League had, uh, where they were run by the cities as afterthoughts, uh, never drew. There was very little promotions. I mean, I remember when they were asking for the city money, the Elizabethan twins said, oh, yes, if you give us this, we'll start a marketing department. Yeah, I, it was 2017, and a professional sports franchise did not have a marketing department? Think about that for a second. So this is one of the reasons why the Appalachian League isn't around anymore, and why I said, boy, do we really need this low-class mom-and-pop stuff? But then Boyd Sports came and they understood promotions. And so the Johnson City Cardinals started setting attendance records. Uh, you had cir circumstances where you had Star Wars night or bring your dog to the ballpark night. And those things remain very popular. And there's no reason whatsoever that they can't continue in a college wooden bat league. In fact, one team that might be the most promotional savvy in all of baseball is a college wooden bat baseball team. It's called the Savannah Bananas. And they're in the Coastal Plains League. And they are known for a dancing first base coach. And they are known for golden, well, they dress like bananas, okay? Not golden, but an all yellow uniform, this sort of thing. Now, some people will say purists will hate that. But I'm a baseball purist. You know what I hate? The DH. I don't necessarily hate colorful uniforms or even a dancing first base coach. I do say, well, what's he out there for? But I'm told that they are schooled and, you know, learning pitchers pick off moves and so on and so forth. And I guess uh, judging outfielders arms or what have you. Look, is the all gold uniform or I should say all yellow uniform of the Savannah Bananas any different? Really, isn't it just the natural progression of, say, the lumber companies, all old gold uniform of back when? Pittsburgh Pirates back in the 70s wore an all gold uniform. So this has been done before. Uh, the dancing first base coach, is that any different than the antics that Charlie Grimm, now that's going back a ways, but Mr. Cub before Ernie Banks was Mr. Cub, is it any different than what Charlie Grimm was doing in his coaching box years and years ago, before World War II, for crying out loud, when Charlie Grimm was a huge, huge popular figure, in large part because he danced in the third base coach's box when he was managing the Cubs. He had a lot of fun out on the field. Well, that's kind of the same thing, natural progression. So I'm okay with that. Here's what I'm not okay, though, with with the Savannah Bananas and minor league baseball in general, and I think it goes into the demise of the Appalachian League. Uh, recently, the Bananas needed a broadcaster, and they advertised it, and they didn't mention that the Bananas were a successful franchise on the field, which they are, nor did they mention the players that were placed into professional baseball uh, from their tutelage, which they've done there in Savannah. They did say we try to push the envelope, and one of the things that they crowed was, oh, our last two first base coaches, the dancing first base coaches, they've both landed with professional dance troops. Now, here's the thing. You're a baseball team. It's all fine and good, but that's like saying, oh, our mascot was rated number one by this organization that chooses mascots or something. It's not even that. What you should be crowing about is, hey, the Savannah Bananas have placed X amount of players in pro ball. The Savannah Bananas have placed X amount of players in the major leagues. Instead, they've placed more first base coaches with dance troops. Now, yeah, that 
is a problem, I think, with modern baseball, especially minor league baseball, where the promotions are bringing in the fans. The money is all green, but are they there to watch baseball, dancing first base coach or otherwise, or are they there because they can dress up like Darth Vader and or Han Solo and take their toy DL-44 with them? That's the big question. Are they there because of baseball or because it's a cheap date and because they've got a bar in left field? Now, when people say, and executives in minor league baseball crow, oh, half our crowd doesn't even know what the score of the game is. Is that really a good thing? What then are you really selling? To tell you the truth, uh, being an old Pittsburgh Pirates fan, I can remember when PNC Park opened up, team was lousy, and what did they market? It's all about the food. Well, then you weren't marketing baseball, and that's why the Buckos lost back then. You were marketing your concession stand. And although, yeah, sure, I want there to be a good concession stand, you've got to ask yourself, are you really in the business of selling hot dogs, or are you in the business of selling baseball? And I'm not sure anybody's selling baseball anymore. I mean, look at all the gimmicks that are in Major League Baseball now. So many of them started in Minor League Baseball. Universal DHs, runners at second to start the 10th inning, uh, seven inning games, uh, the intentional walk where you say, what happened? Oh, they just pointed him down. I didn't, I missed that. You know, the confusion about intentional walks. Uh, the scheduling, interleague scheduling, that's mostly a major league baseball thing. I mean, you don't see the Appalachian League playing the Pioneer League in the past. But nevertheless, it kills as many rivalries interleague play does as it creates uh, pitch counts. Obviously, they're even, I mean, you're lucky to see a starting pitcher go four innings in the Appalachian League. Uh, pitch clocks, that's a minor league baseball thing. One of the beauties of baseball is it has no clock. No more, thanks to minor league baseball gimmicks. Day-night double headers, playoff tournaments where teams with losing records make it, emphasis on political correctness. Uh, you know, all these things that major league baseball now has that really make you think, this is not the game that I fell in love with. So many of these things started in minor league baseball because we want the fannies in the seats and they weren't selling baseball because you'd never have to put these things in. They were selling gimmicks. And because they were selling gimmicks, now the sport is overrun with gimmicks and it is less popular than it was before. All that stuff, I think, came about and started in the Appalachian League. And it just goes to show you, look, guys, if years ago in the Appalachian League, city leaders said, hmm, better baseball team. You know what? That would make this area a better place to live, a higher caliber place to live, just like a city wants a major league baseball team, like Nashville does. What if we moved up the baseball ladder? If somebody had thought of that, then maybe we'd still be talking about a baseball team we can all come together with instead of, well, you know what, it's not going to be so bad. They'll still have Star Wars night, I'm sure. What's more important? Where's the sport going? This, to me, is a sign of baseball's demise. Folks, I'm Marky Bilson. I'm going to talk to you next time right here on YouTube. I ask that you follow me on YouTube. And now I'm on Parlor at Sports Media Pro. No more Twitter, but Parlor. That's where I'm at. I invite you to follow me there. Until next time, I'm Marky Bilson.